Hello everyone. Uh, this presentation will be given in English. I'm Matheus Tavares, he's Renato G. And as already introduced, we are going to talk about object-oriented techniques in C. And we are going to take a look at two examples uh, on the kernel, the Linux kernel, and on Git projects. We are both from USP and from FluSP, the free software group at USP. Okay? So, the motivation behind it, why we're going to look at this? Well, it's always fun to look at things like object in C, but why do we use that? There is this two sentences that we like a lot. They are from the author of Object Oriented Programming with C. This is a very nice book. He says, no programming techniques solves all problems. No programming language produces only correct results. Uh, when we talk about programming languages, we tend to be a little bit energetic. So sometimes we say, no, Python is the best language because it has garbage collector and it has, I don't know, it's expressive. And then someone says, no, assembly is the best language because you can like control the beats and all those things. So yeah, all the languages are cool. Other languages have a purpose and it can be used on different kinds of projects and areas. So no language is perfect and no technique is perfect. So what we, gonna, what we want to share with you today is how you can use uh, good techniques which are not native present in a language like C to perform, uh, to solve problems, general problems. This is the content that we will go over today, hopefully. Uh, we will start with basic objects. So we'll talk about private attributes and private, private methods. Then we'll go over uh, inheritance, and we have here what we call public and private inheritance. That's a term that we define, and we'll talk about it later. Then we have also multiple inheritance, abstract classes and polymorphism. And then we'll go a little bit uh, off the topic on metaprogramming, and we'll see one design pattern, which is an iterator. This metaprogramming is a little bit like, it's a shading, so not really metaprogramming, but we'll get there. Uh, just one. Uh, final thing before I give the word to you, Renato. All the code we'll see, this presentation will not go over very deep into uh, the theory, 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 yeah, sorry, theory behind uh, these concepts. We will show like real code and we'll go over code, so no theory. And all the code that we will see uh, in the end of the slide on the footer, we have uh, the link, the, not the link, the path in the respective repositories, the kernel and git repository, where you can find the file to see the actual code for yourself. So, yeah, without further ado, Renato will talk a little about the kernel. Um, hi, so um, as Mateus mentioned, I'm Renato, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Sao Paulo, and um, I've been a recent contributor to the Linux kernel for about nine months, and during this time, I managed to find some pretty beautiful um, excerpts of code, and I just wanted to go over a few of them, a couple of them. Um, and so we're gonna cover Linux IAO, which is the industrial input output device, uh, industrial input output subsystem. And uh, just a show of hands, how many of you um, were in Marcelo Schmidt's um, talk about the IAO and the AD7292, if I'm not mistaken? Okay, all right, it was a pretty good talk and uh, it, it's basically the same subsystem. And so um, in, the Linux, in the Linux IAO, we have a class, well, a struct, which is the IAO dev, which belongs to the API that the IAO uses for um, general use for, so every driver has to talk to the, um, to the kernel. So we basically um, generalize drivers through the IAO dev, which stands for industrial input output device. And, um, Every driver has, their own, it has its own implementation. And so the AD7780, which is um, a driver I, I contribute and maintain, is an analog to digital sigma delta converted device. Um, so the AD7780 state is the struct that holds all the relevant information for the AD7780. And um, what we want to do is we want to sh show how to make the AD7780 state a subclass of IIO dev. Okay? So we're gonna do this through uh, composition. Um, so there are two ways basically to do composition. I'm gonna show the first one, which we call public, which we call private inheritance, and then we'll go over the other one. 
Okay, so inheritance by composition. So I'm, I'm defining S to be the sub superclass, C the subclass, and um, assume N and M to be S and C's memory size in bytes. So basically it's size of, right? And uh, we're gonna create an object C, which is the child class in the following way. We're gonna allocate a block B of size N plus M plus A. I'm gonna talk about A, what A is, and that's in bytes. And uh, we're gonna save the first N bytes for the superclass, okay? And save the last M bytes for the child. And we're basically gonna return a pointer of block B as a type of the superclass, right? So this B is gonna be basically the superclass, which has a subclass C, which is private. Okay, so next slide, please. So just to remind us of the definitions, um, IODEV is the superclass, C is the child, and then we have uh, sizes and bytes. Um, so basically we use DevM in the IO, we use DevM IO device alloc to allocate this block B and return a pointer of IO dev, which is the superclass. Um, these are the files that you can look, up, look for, the function right there. Um, okay. So how do we access the subclass given a block B that we just defined? Well, we use this, this, uh, this function here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about A, that constant A in a second. Um, so basically what we have is a block of memory with the first n bytes to be the superclass, then we get a, a border A, and then we get the, the subclass C all the way down the superclass, all right? So we wanna find this A, and I'm gonna tell you why we use this A soon enough in the next slide. So basically what we have here is a function that accesses, that returns the pointer to the subclass, okay? So it basically takes the pointer to um, AD7780 state. So basically it gets the pointer of, um, of the superclass and then it adds some value here, which is a line, so that we can find this subclass. And um, you can see this, that this function here, a line is a macro, and it basically takes some constant here, which is a power of two, and then you basically take one from the power of two and then there's this black magic function here, which has a bunch of uh, bitwise, and I'm gonna go through it, and I'm gonna try to, oh, whoops, explain what exactly this does, okay? So you can, you can check this for yourself, I'm not lying to you or anything. Um, I just, I changed the code to be more legible, but it's basically the same thing. Okay, so, I told you that we needed a constant A, right? So why, why do we need that? Well, recall from Computer Science 101, we, ha we have that access to memory to a power of two is faster, right? Um, so what we wanna do is make the pointer to the subclass to be a power of two, okay? And we don't wanna waste memory, so we're gonna make this A that makes the pointer to the subclass as minimal as possible, okay? So that's what I just said, and this is the claim, is that that function aligned there, it basically gets you the smallest multiple of this constant A that is greater than X. Okay. So in, um, to visualize better, what we have up there is IO dev, which has um, size of N, and then we get a constant A here. And then we have the subclass here. And what we wanna show you is that this is a power of two. In other words, this divides a power of two. Since this here is a power of two, then any multiple of it must be a power of two. Right, so, sorry. So I'm sorry, I'm, I come from a mathematical background, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, what we have here is basically n and m are in integers, right? m is, we saw earlier that we took a constant and we subtracted one from it, right? And that's m, which is a power of two minus one. And we have here that, that formula, that wacky formula there, basically divides a power of two. So this means that this wacky formula is a power of two. So I'm not gonna go through step by step um, because I know that I'm gonna bore you and I, I, I know, I've seen too many lectures on math. 
but basically what we're going to do, I'm going to go and um, do an overview of it, is we're going to take this guy here and we're going to get rid of the, the bitwise operators because they're a pain to, to manipulate, okay? So what we're doing here is getting rid of this, this guy here, okay? So we're basically finding a, an, an equivalence here and then we got just a, uh, an end bitwise operator. Um, okay, next one. And what we're doing now is we're getting rid of the end operator. So for you guys who have seen Boolean algebra, that's the standard formula for, for getting rid of the end operator. And what we're basically going to do is we're going to use that guy there, n plus m, okay? And so we get this equivalence here. This guy here is going to be exactly this. Trust me, it works. Um, and then once we get this, this guy here, it's, it's easy to, to find that the, that guy is a power of two just by, by checking for divisibility, right? So here I'm checking that some subcases for and when it's less than a power of two, when it's greater than power of two, then we, we have to um, check for subcases. So we have case one, when it divides, when it doesn't divide, and okay. Okay, um, another subcase for that. And okay, finished. Okay, we're done. We're done. Thanks for watching. Um, so we get this here is divisible for some integer p, which I'm claiming that it's a power of two. Okay. Uh, another lemma, right? Okay, so another lemma, but this, we, what we basically showed previously was that it was a multiple of a power of two, okay? And what we want to show now th is that it is actually minimal. What we do is we take the, sa the same formula here and we basically say that it's minimal, okay? So, okay, next slide. And it's the same subcases, okay? So you, can, uh, you can either trust me or you can read that and... I'd appreciate if you read it, but you don't have it. So why we have it is that claim there, and we're gonna dress it up and call it a theorem. I know it's presumptuous of me, but a theorem, and it's basically gonna say that a line is minimal and it's a power of two, and it follows directly from lemma one and lemma two. It's easy to see. Okay, no more math, I promise. So. A line in the wild, what we're basically doing in, uh, in, in theory, we're gonna put it in practice. So this is the guy that allocates memory. And this is that priv function there that basically takes the superclass in, in the dev is basically IAO dev, right? And we have ED7780 stage, which is ST. So we're basically allocating that block B there. And we're calling IAO priv to find the subclass ST, okay? And then we're gain, and then we can do stuff with it. You can check in here. Okay, that's fine. So we went, to, went through private inheritance. I'm gonna talk about why it's called private. And we have now public inheritance. Um, I told you that IIO dev is a superclass of 87780 Well, it turns out that 87780 state is also a subclass of add sigma delta. I told you that AD7780 is an analog to digital converter and it's an add sigma delta converter. And we in the IEO subsystem have an API for add sigma delta converters. So we could use that, right? So what we're basically gonna do is AD7780 state must be a subclass of add sigma delta. But it's kind of a different way, right? Because AD7780 state is inside the superclass and now the superclass is inside the subclass. So that's weird. Uh, but they both use composition in a different way. So I told you we use it as, we call it private inheritance. Well, as you may have noticed, uh, the attribute is actually private. Why? Because we need to know the type in order to cast it, okay? Um, it's also a runtime inheritance. It means that when we allocate the block, we are actually allocating it in runtime and not in compile time. Um, and the subclass can be of any type, 8780, 7793, or this 7292 from Marcel. Um, now this is what we call public inheritance. Why? Because they're always public. You're gonna see, um, 
later, it's basically, you're basically um, defining your struct to have a subclass. Um, so it's basically compile time inheritance. OK, so we're going to talk about public inheritance now. Uh, this is the add sigma delta. And below it, you can find the 87780 state. And this is its de declaration. So you basically see that there is an add sigma delta here, which is the superclass, right? And uh, basically, in private inheritance, the superclass contains the subclass. And in public inheritance, the subclass contains the superclass. So, but given the, um, given the superclass, how can we find this subclass? if um, now it's, it, it's basically the, the inverse operation, right? Because, late, because earlier we had the superclass and then we had to find the subclass inside of it. And now we have the superclass, which is inside of the subclass, and we have to find what's outside of it. Okay, it's, I know it's confusing. Um, well, we use container of, which is a, another magical function here. Uh, uh, you might have noticed this guy here. It's kind of weird, right? But um, this is where you can find it. But um, basically, what this guy does is, is a trick. Um, you might think that this um, actually um, does something like it, it outputs a seg fault, or maybe it doesn't even compile. But actually, the compiler is pretty smart. And it, um, it actually identifies this. And uh, basically, it returns that. Um, it basically returns the distance between member and zero. So it basically computes where it would be if the struct were allocated to the zero address. So basically, it does this. You're given add sigma delta, and you basically want 87780 state. So what you do is you have to find n sub 1. How you do that? Container of. It basically takes the pointer p, and then it subtracts n sub 1, OK? That's pretty simple. It's, well, simpler than the other one. Um, OK. So I basically told you about public and private inheritance. So this is what we call private inheritance. This is what we call public inheritance. This is the guy that we want and are given IAO dev. Um, in cover position, we have the we're given add sigma delta, and we want 87780 state. So they're basically analogs, but they're, they're basically opposites. Uh, so there are different approaches for different uses. Um, which one is better? It depends on what you need. Um, do we leave, leave questions to the end? Just a little question. When you say superclass and subclass, we're referring to the specialization of the class. Not the, where the class is declared or is it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically um, hierarchy and not where it is. Another word would be parent class or child class. And now that I bored you to death, you're going to see actually fun stuff with Git. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have uh, lemmas and <laughs> all the theorems. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we're going to see the same things implemented in Git. We're going to talk about the iterator object. Uh, for those who know design patterns or have seen iterators before, this is uh, an iterator object. What it does is you give a path to a directory, and then it iterates over the directory subcontents and recursively into the subdirectories. Is that okay? okay. So that's a simplified use case or of how you use the, the iterator. So this is the declaration. Uh, I use object-oriented. Uh, Slang because it's easier and, and I've just been using it already, so I feel like I can uh, use it as well. So that's a constructor there, and here you have the destructor. And what you do is you give the path and then you iterate until you have something to iterate. You know that because of the iter OK uh, return code. And when you want to stop, you just call the abort function, which is a destructor. To access the iterations data, you just use iter and its all the attributes. Its attributes, its public attributes are the are referring to the current iteration status. So, for example, this gives you the uh, the type of file that you are currently iterating over. So, regular file, directory, and these kind of things. Yes. Okay. So, this is the API which the API users can include. Uh, 
the, the directory reconstruct is declared here, and these are all public attributes. So these three first strings are the path, the relative path to where you started, and the base name of the file, the current file. ST is the result of calling the function stat or lstat on the given path. And these are the public methods. So the constructor that we talked earlier, the destructor, and the advanced function that we just previously saw. Oh, uh, as, as always, the files are in the footer. Okay, but what about private methods? We all know how to make public methods in C, but oh, public attributes and methods. But how do you make private methods and attributes? That's the catchy thing. So here is the full declaration of a deuterator. And the trick is, this is not declared on the header, this is declared on the .c file, so the API users cannot see what is here. The deuterator int stands for a deuterator internal, and the first thing it has on the struct is an instance of the private, the public attributes that we just saw. After that, following, we have the private attributes, and here are here is the constructor. <coughs> this will make much more sense if you see the constructor. So how does it work? Basically, the first thing you do in our constructor is to allocate memory for a deuterator internal, not the external. Then you get the address of the first elements here on the struct, which is our set of public attributes, right? And then you initialize all the fields, you allocate all the memory that you need, you do the values you need to, and what you return is not the, the whole thing, but just the, the point to the first one, okay? So, yeah, please. Uh, the users will, will, all, won't, won't be able to see the private methods. And how do you access it then, if you're just returning the public ones? Well. The public methods can receive a deuterator, and then it can cast to a deuterator intern and use it whatever it wants to. And how does it work? Basically, you are allocating much more memory than you need to. You are allocating memory to a structed deuterator internal, and you are returning a variable of the type structured deuterator. But the thing is, it doesn't matter the type of the variable you are returning. The address, the byte address, is the same because it's the first member of the struct. So when you get it inside the function, the public methods, uh, you can safely cast it to a much larger memory uh, variable because you know that that memory has been allocated before. Is that okay? okay right. uh, this technique is very great because you can easily hide uh, fields from a struct in C, but unless it has some drawbacks, you need to be careful with that. So for example, if you want to use functions that's something like main copy, for example, where you need to give the size of the memory you are copying, uh, you cannot rely on size of byte, on size of, because size of struct deuterator won't be the same as size of struct deuterator internal, okay? Also, you cannot declare an array of struct deuterators. Otherwise, when you initialize it, the memory from the first one uh, will be occupying the second one as well, and you'll get corrupted data. And finally, you cannot let your API users construct their deuterator for themselves. You need to make them use your constructor function because you are the one who knows how much memory you allocate and how much private man attributes you have. Okay, uh, public and private methods, that's easy. What about private uh, attributes? What about private methods? That's as simple as declaring something that's static inside the .c, that's something we all do, and that will make this function uh, only visible to the dots or to the object file. And the public methods can then handle just the internal to the private methods. Fine. Uh, the deuterator is then used to perform some more complex things at Git, and it's used as a superclass for other kinds of iterators. And we, what we'll see now are on these files here. And what they implement is abstract classes, inheritance, multiple inheritance, and a little bit of polymorphism. Uh, for those who don't know what half references on Git are, basically they are pointers. So uh, a tag, a branch, a remote branch, they are all implemented as Git references on, on Git's code base. So, yeah. Uh, a half iterator is nothing more than a, an iterator that can go over your branches or over your tags. And that's useful, useful for example, when you're listing the tags or listing your branches, for example. Uh, that's a big picture right there. So we have the 
half iterator, which is an abstract class. Do you all remember what an abstract class is somehow? Okay, for those who don't, an abstract class uh, is a class in which you may or may not have code declared, but you cannot instantiate it. You can only instantiate the, its sub subclasses, the, the real implementation, right? And when the subclass doesn't have a method, it can just like fall back to the superclass method if it is implemented. If not, the subclass needs to implement. Right, uh, then we have lots of implementations of this half iterator abstract class, and the one we're going to be looking at is the files half log iterator. Again, files half log iterator, uh, as Renato previously showed uh, an example of multiple inheritance. Uh, it is also multiple inheritance right there. It is inheriting from half iterator and also the dear iterator that we just saw. And the way it is doing, it's basically the same as a private and public inheritance that we previously saw. Uh, half, when, you, when you create an instance of this class right there, in fact, what the constructor returns is an instance of this one. I'm saying instance because I just said abstract classes cannot have instance. But it's a variable of this type, which contains on its private attributes the data for this one. Is that okay? We will see the code, I think it will make it easier. So uh, that's the abstract class first. For those who are familiar with C++ and D, or work with compilers and interpreters, probably that's ringing a bell right there about the vtable. Vtable is commonly used, uh, it's a name commonly used for virtual methods table, which is used for compiled, no, not compile time, dynamic dispatch of methods. So for example, uh, you don't know the methods at compile time, but at executed run running time, uh, the methods are assigned to that table. So that's basically a table of methods, of functions. And those are the abstract uh, class uh, methods. And you can see that it doesn't have a real implementation. What it does, it receives a copy of a ref iterator, and it calls the function, the respectively function, from the table of that instance of a ref table, of a ref iterator. Is that too obscure? Or is that kind of okay? Repeat that or? Explain a little more? Right. Okay, no problem. Uh, basically, you have, let's go back one slide, please. No, one more. Yeah, nice. So this one is an abstract class. I'm saying class, but that's an instruct. What I'm referring as class is an instruct with some methods, some functions associated with that. Uh, and that's an implementation, a concrete implementation of this abstract class. So let's go back there. Nice. These functions receive a copy of the abstract class itself. These functions don't know uh, which one of the subclasses these variables is. So it may be a files have log iterator or it may be any other one. So how does it know which function to call as it doesn't know from which class it is? Well, the functions are all in the V table, so it's assigned on running time. It's not on compilation time. Okay. Oh, okay, the subclass. So this is the implementation of one of the subclass, the half log iterator. Uh, and as you can see, it's basically the same that you did with the iterator. So you start allocating memory for much more bigger memory than you need. You're gonna allocate memory for the files half log iterator. Then you're gonna get uh, the address of the first field of this struct, which is the public attributes. And you're gonna initialize all the things that you need to and just return the public part. So as uh, no, you, yeah, you can, as Renato was showing on on kernel slides, this is uh, a kind of private inheritance. And no, just one more. And here we have the public inheritance. Where I'm sorry, the, one, the first one was the public inheritance. This is the private inheritance. So here we have the G iterator as a private attribute of the half logs iterator. Finally, after all these obscure things, let's just see. A little more obscure things uh, <laughs> with metaprogramming. I said before that this is cheating because it's no real metaprogramming. It's just some something that looks like metaprogramming, but we would like to show to share that with you uh, because it's interesting how what things you can do with the preprocessor uh, of C. So yeah, here we have on blame.c for those who are familiar with git blame. This is the code that runs when you use git blame. Not just that, of course. There's much more code. Uh, but what's funny here is that 
we have this declaration of a static struct, blame suspects, blame suspects. But if you look the upper part of the code that's omitted here and the headers, there is no declaration for a static struct blame suspects. So where does it come from? How can you declare something that you've never seen the code before? And in fact, uh, this thing which looks like a function call but is in fact a macro uh, is where it's been declared. So let's see how it's done. This macro just calls two other macros and let's see them. The first one is simple. It declares the struct that we set. So we are giving the name of the struct as the parameter of the macro. And then we are de declaring the struct with that parameter. The next one, another call, another macro, which calls this macro here. And this macro declares a lot of functions. I'm, I omitted some of them, but there are many more, uh, which receives that struct that we just previously declared. And also, this thing right here. It's a way for you to concatenate names uh, in the preprocessor so that you can give the name, uh, given in the macros parameter to the function. I think that's it. Right. Uh, então, palmas, por favor. Thank you.